I went to doctor after doctor wanting them to fix me and they prescribed something new. Sometimes um, the side effects that would make things worse for me and nothing got better. Uh, I wasn't able to be there the way I wanted to be there for my kids and the way they needed me. So I kind of had to rethink everything about how we were living. Empowering you organically, delivering content you trust with results you love. Welcome everyone to another episode of Empowering You Organically. I'm your host, Jonathan Hunsaker, joined by my co-host, Terry Intervenin. Hey everyone. We have a very special guest today. This is actually one of our inspired health journeys and we have Susie Skogard with us. Thank you, Susie, for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is gonna be an awesome podcast. I'm just reading your bio, reading your history. I'm just super excited to share your story with the world. Terry, do you wanna read through her bio? Absolutely. Susie is a vegan health coach and blogger, as well as a volunteer crisis counselor with Crisis Text Line. She owns a gluten-free vegan bakery just outside of Lansing, Michigan, Carly Cakes, and they operate under a mission to employ adults with developmental disabilities and pay them a living wage. So first and foremost, I just love what you do. I love what you do. Just gives you all those good feelings. And um, I love bakery treats too. So I think everything you're doing with your profession is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, thank you so much. It was um, inspired by my youngest who has celiac. So uh, she also has Down syndrome and it was kind of, um, but wanting to find a way that she could be included in birthday treats and celebrations. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Give us some history. Tell us about your health journey and just what started you on this entire path in life. Okay. Well, my youngest, like I said, while amazing and perfect, was also born with Down syndrome, um, as well as a life-threatening heart condition. Uh, With that heart condition, we had a couple of close calls, months of hospital stays, um, and she ended up having open heart surgery at four months old. Uh, I didn't really know how to cope with all that. And because it happened so fast, I never got the time to process any of it. And I wound up with postpartum PTSD. Uh, My anxiety was through the roof. I was miserable. And to self-medicate, I was eating junk and drinking a lot of alcohol at night. I was about 55 pounds heavier than I am right now. Um, The extra weight was a strain on my body. I was always tired. I was never able to sleep and I was really truly suffering from my rheumatoid arthritis. I went to doctor after doctor wanting them to fix me and they prescribed something new. Sometimes um, the side effects that would make things worse for me and nothing got better. Uh, I wasn't able to be there the way I wanted to be there for my kids and the way they needed me. So I kind of had to rethink everything about how we were living. So I woke up one day and just reached my limit. I told my husband that I needed to change. I needed to get healthy, even if I wasn't sure what healthy even was at this point. Um, And we had both said at various points that we were going to get healthier. But this time I told him that I meant it and I was going to do it with him or without him. Um, That night, his blood pressure got to dangerous levels and he collapsed to the floor. Um, he was hospitalized and it was that moment of realizing that that situation could have resulted in a serious stroke, uh, complete kidney failure, or even death. Uh, that was the wake up call that it was now or never. And thankfully we were in this together and we were going to, um, do these changes together. I, you know, I, I, it's, it's just hard to even hear the story because, you know, you sometimes have to hit that rock bottom to make that change. And I just can't imagine. I mean, it was one thing after another, after another, that was just stacking up against you. And, and I can imagine just being up against the wall at that point, putting your arms up like enough is enough. It's time to do something. And unfortunately, a, a lot of people don't do something right. They continue to talk about doing something. They continue to think about doing something. They want to do something, but then they, they stay on the same path. And so um, I love that you did something. What was the biggest change that you made? What was that big something? Well, before, we, before he even got home from the hospital, um, I cleared out all the alcohol and high salt foods from our house. Um, but the doctors gave very little other direction for us to follow. Um, but I knew I needed to start cooking more. Um, And I didn't really understand what the best options were for us then nutritionally. But looking back, I see that I still established that routine of daily cooking and meal prep. And we were able to cut out fast food and restaurant meals. I started doing daily yoga first at home using Yoga by Adrian 
free videos on YouTube. And then once I was comfortable enough, I found a studio in a gym. Uh, I also began heavily relying on Buddhist philosophy to unscramble the PTSD, which led me to a new understanding about the nature of suffering. Like we have physical pain and the pain of loss and change, but then there's also pervasive pain. Say if we were injured in an accident, we'd have the physical pain of the accident, the suffering or change of our car being totaled, but we'd also have pervasive pain, which is the pain we can control. And in that imaginary accident scenario, it might be worrying what everyone else is going to think about us. It might be replaying over and over what we could have done differently. We can't truly control physical pain or the pain of loss or change. They're going to happen, but we can control pervasive pain and who doesn't want to hurt less. So the rest of our journey grew from my desire to reduce the pervasive suffering that I was putting out into the world and to also free my mind for it. Um, the day I woke up and began a different life for our family, I didn't wake up with any less depression or anxiety than I had had the day before. I didn't wake up with any less swollen or achy joints than I'd had the day before. I didn't wake up with more money or less on my plate. Um, we were all extremely sick. There was nothing good that had changed to lead us in that direction. Um, nothing about our situation really changed, but the way that I looked at it did. So I, I think there's a few good points there in what you shared. I mean, first of all, you talk about being in the hospital and, and really not being given any advice. I think that there's definitely a place and a purpose for modern medicine and what conventional medicine can do. But one thing that we know and is fact is that a lot of doctors aren't um, trained and they don't have a lot of education in nutrition. And so I think that's one place where when you face a really big health scare, like your family faced that, you know, people really have to dig deep because most of the time the answer is here's a pill to fix what's wrong, which really creates more symptoms and more issues. But really it's like, what are you eating and what are you going to change? And even if they ask you that question and go down that path, it's such a small list of things that they'll walk through with you to talk about how you can change your health. And so I think you taking that initiative to go out and say, I'm getting all this out of my house. I'm bringing this into my house and I'm going to make this lifestyle change is a huge step that a lot of people never make because they feel like it's such a daunting task, but it's one of the best changes you can make nutrition impacts every aspect of our lives in ways we can't even imagine. And it's not something that we're talked to about frequently when it comes to going to the doctor, facing health issues, getting our health back on track, but it's such a critical component of our health. And I think the second thing that you talked about that was really, really important is it's not just about our physical health, but it's about our emotional health and well-being. which, you know, we also don't talk about this enough, but our emotional health and well-being is extremely tied to how we feel physically and vice versa. And so I think it's really powerful in sharing your story that you made big changes for your family with nutrition and emotional well-being, but you didn't notice the changes right away. It's not like some big, massive thing happened the next day. Massive change requires massive action, but to see the success of that action takes time. It's a process. It's not like instant gratification, you know, good health, long-term health is a long journey and a long process. And it doesn't ever look the same from day to day. It changes day to day because our bodies are constantly changing. So I think it's a really powerful message. Thank you. Yeah. And it really did come down to just baby steps. Like, you know how everybody's um, into Marie Kondo and the life-changing magic of tidying up. Yeah. Uh, I started Marie Kondoing my brain. Um, all our routines, everything that we ate, I would examine what we did objectively. So what was I putting into my body? Did it bring me joy? And there were a lot of foods that I just ate or served out of habit mindlessly that I didn't even like, um, that the family didn't even like. My kids had the same amount of you factor to dishes that I would put down then that they do, you know, occasionally now. Um, so it, there were foods that I did like, and I could say that they also did bring me joy, but maybe they weren't the best option to build my diet around. 
Um, so I started reflecting on what that joy actually meant to me. Was it a temporary moment derived from immediate pleasure or was it the kind that came from being the kind of parent I wanted to be? Um, from having a body I could be comfortable in, joints that weren't angry and screaming at me all the time. And in that moment of reflection and pause before eating, there was that breakthrough. Uh, the novelty of a treat would wear off and I wouldn't feel like I was actually missing out on anything by picking a healthier treat because I was actively choosing in that moment health. Um, so my focus became progress, not perfection. And those little daily cho choices uh, led us to the point where we could start making big changes overall. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point. I think, you know, that overall theme of what you're sharing here is just choice. You have choice and you made choices and those choices brought about, you know, the success you're now seeing with your family and your health. And it's just those choices moment to moment, day to day, week to week that build on one another and bring that relief your family was looking for of better health and going on a journey of health that would benefit every member of your family, which is really powerful choices. I think one of the most powerful things we have, and it's one of the most difficult things to face as far as we have to choose for ourselves things that make life better. And it's harder you know, for people to do than we can even imagine. It's such a big thing to take that first step into the unknown, especially when it comes to your body and say, I'm doing something drastically different. So hard. Well, you know, I mean, I, and I did a video about this a few days ago. I think a lot of people get lost in the planning and they get lost in the perfection, right? So I'm going to, this is exactly what we're going to eat is we're going to eat every single day and we're going to do this and we're going to work out. And, and they create this whole plan, which might take weeks to create, which helps procrastinate taking that first step. And then you start following that plan and all of a sudden reality hits. It's not like you thought it would be in your head. There's all these shifts, all these pivots, all these mm -hmm. things you have to do. And the best thing to do is you don't need to make a plan. Just get started taking some sort of action, right? Just get, just clean the alcohol out of the house. Then what's next step? Let's start cooking home cooked meals. Hey, they may not all be clean. They may not all be organic. They may not all be healthy, but let's get out of the habit of eating at restaurants. Let's get out of the habit of, you know, eating the, the junk processed foods and, slowly it'll get better and better. I mean, and that's what you're sharing is like, I mean, you would get to a point to where it was a healthy tree that you would choose, but that not all of that starts on day one. It's all right. just a process of uh, just, you know, introducing your body into this new way of living into eating. And it doesn't all have to be done overnight. Absolutely. So talk to us about what are some of the changes that you made in your diet? Well, um, getting rid of soda was a huge one for me. I was a massive Diet Coke drinker. I drank, um, there was a day that I drank 24 cans of Diet Coke. Wow. I'm not even exaggerating. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, one of the, I knew that that was one of the ones that had to go right away. Um, so I began to learn about the environmental toll that processed foods take on our planet. Uh, I learned that there are 844 million people um, that's one in 10 of our global population currently affected by the global water crisis. So every day, more than 800 children under five die without access to clean drinking water. So when you think about the fact that it takes 132 gallons of water to make a two liter bottle of soda, that's 132 gallons that would mean a chance at life to someone else. And I know that just because I'm not drinking it doesn't mean that a single life will be saved, but as part of the reducing suffering, that meant removing myself from cycles where I was actively contributing. Um, and then we started making the shift uh, to sustainable living. And it was that environmental avenue that led me into veganism. I watched a few vegan documentaries on Netflix and from the reduce the suffering angle, I knew 100% that it was the next big step we needed to make. Uh, I could not support factory farms and I wanted to combat climate change as best as I could. But I had hesitations. There are unhealthy vegans and I didn't want to end up um, in just a new way to be unhealthy. So I really started researching the vegan diet for evidence-based improvements. And through that, I found whole foods plant-based lifestyle. Eating whole foods plant-based has been linked to a number of health benefits, including reducing and even reversing heart disease, certain cancers, obesity, diabetes, and cognitive decline. Um, in order to make that uh, transition, for our family, I took a couple of whole foods plant-based nutrition courses and read How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger over and over and over so that I would be armed with all the information that we would need to be successful. Um, and I'm gonna clarify that when I'm talking about the whole foods plant-based lifestyle, it has absolutely nothing to do with the store whole foods. <laughs> 
So it's just a way to say minimally processed and nothing added, nothing taken away from your food. That means no meats, no cheeses, no eggs, no refined sugar, um, no cooking oil, even olives. That means when you look at a label for peanut butter, it says peanuts. And we eat our beans, berries, fruits, cruciferous veggies, greens, flax seeds, and nuts every day. We do supplement our B vitamins, but we also um, use a lot of nutritional yeast, so we still get some in for our food. I also make sure the kids get plenty of fats for their developing brains, but they get it from things like avocado or flax milk, so they don't get that saturated fat or the hormones that dairy milk has. Flax milk is actually a better source of calcium, protein, and omega-3 than dairy. So cutting out those processed foods made it easier for our whole household to keep gluten at bay for my celiac daughter, um, drastically cutting her risk of cross-contamination, contamination, uh, improved her health dramatically. Her skin got better, um, her stomach bloat went away, and leading me to find that gluten was also making my rheumatoid arthritis worse, it was contributing to inflammation. I started a daily routine of celery juice, amla, turmeric, and ginger um, that I toss everything in all together and drink it every morning and I've never felt better. Awesome. Yeah. And it's interesting you talking about your, you know, the diet with your kids and, and I, I don't even like to call it a diet. I really don't like that word. So I shouldn't use that word, but I think everybody has different choices in their nutrition and how they eat and how they do things. But I think some Thing really interesting about your story is that you know, we just did a podcast last week on kids and kids eating healthier and how it's impacting their emotions and their behavior and how it's impacting their success in school. And you know, you're you're a perfect example of someone who's taken this new way of life for you and your family. Your choice, which is the most important thing, that you have a choice in how your family eats. But once you make that choice, people are so scared to dive into that with their kids and their family. But I think we live in a day and age where there's so much information available right? Um, I've used a lot of the different things that you just talked about to cook. And while I'm not vegan, um, there are all of these things you've talked about in your nutrition for your family and how you're cooking. There are so many creative ways to cook for kids that they will like the food and they can enjoy the food. I think people here, like you cook at home and you make really healthy food for your kids. Do they even eat? Do you guys eat? How do you even eat anything that sounds good or fun? And it's like, I think it's such a misconception, right? Like I love hearing your story because there are so many ways to cook at home and make it fun and make it taste good. And I think some of the misconceptions, whether you're keto or you're vegan or whatever it is that you eat, I think people always have these stigmas of like, well, then their food just must not be good or their kids must not eat their food. And I love that you've kind of just taken the bull by the horns and you're like, yes, we can do this. Yes, there are creative ways for my kids to eat. Yes, there are options for us. And look at all these different things that you and your family eat. And that's such a powerful, you know, a powerful testimonial to the fact that we can make choices for our family, find creative ways to make those choices work and have a happier, healthier family. Super powerful. When I, I mean, I love the idea that you changed it for your whole family, right? So your daughter had celiac. And so it was like, let's get rid of everything in the house that's gluten. Right. And so it's not just her that has to eat different or that's treated differently. You're following it. Your husband's following it. Right. I mean, you're feeding it to the whole family, which I think makes it that much easier because somebody isn't being left out or they don't get the treats or they don't get treated. And so, yeah, I just I, I think it was all um, really effective the way that you did it. And, and I love the clarity around whole foods. We talk about whole foods, plant-based diets a lot. We've had Ocean Robbins on here. We've had a lot of people that follow a whole food plant-based diet. And yeah, we're not talking about whole foods a place. It's we're sad that in this day and age, a lot of people think that whole food diets are <laughs> from whole, whole foods, foods right? from the grocery store. But it's true. We're just talking about the yeah. way it was grown outside. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it up in boxes and bags yeah. and processed and ground up and all of that, just the way it was meant to be grown. In so many kids are going to grow up in this generation and be like, what's a whole food, which is really sad. I think that things are changing. I think that that's coming back into, you know, the forefront of people's minds, how we're eating and supplements and all of the things that we discuss on this podcast. But so many kids, you would say whole foods and they're like, what is that? Exactly. They have no idea. No idea. All right, so you got to tell us what was the biggest obstacle that you faced on this journey? Um, well, there were a lot of, like you were talking about, a lot of misconceptions about the whole foods plant-based lifestyle. So everybody always asks me if it's about us getting protein. <laughs> and uh, veggies have a surprising amount of protein. Broccoli has a higher protein per calorie ratio than steak. Um, 
obviously you have to eat a lot of broccoli to get that, but it still has a higher protein per calorie ratio to steak. And when you're eating nothing but a lot of different types of veggies and a lot of different types of nuts and grains, it's really easy to make it up. Um, uh, it also was a lot easier getting the kids to adapt to the changes than I even thought that it would be. Um, my son was an incredibly picky eater. Um, it goes in part with his endocrine um, disorder and they all still adapted quite quickly. We created a routine around it. So they started helping with the dinners um, and get, getting them involved in their food choices and empowering them to make the right choices and explaining to them there's this one and this one will do this for your body or there's this one and this one's not going to do this and it might make you feel a little bit sick to your tummy, you know, but you, you can make the choice and just kind of empowering them to make that choice for themselves. It was actually a lot easier getting the kids to adapt the changes than I expected it to be. Um, and my son was an incredibly picky eater, but they adapted quite quickly because we created a whole routine around it and they could help. Um, even the youngest one could still find something to do, whether it was just, you know, um, helping prepare the salads. And, and my littlest one, the one with Down syndrome, likes to tear up lettuce. And we just give her her own little bowl of lettuce that she can sit and tear up while everybody's cooking. And she gets to participate just as much. Um, so we taught them about why we were making those changes too. And the bottom line is, is it's just the food that was available. You know, if there's no junk to really choose from in the cupboards, they aren't gonna pick it. <laughs> it's just not there. They're, if they have a choice between, okay, I have an apple or a banana, they still feel like they're making a decision. Um, their palates then change over time and now they prefer um, healthier foods saying that other foods, processed foods, when we go to a birthday party or something, I, I do let them have whatever cupcakes are served, um, but they'll usually opt not to, saying that it's too sweet. Love uh, it. Yeah, and everyone also thinks that it's so much more expensive to eat this way, but it's really only buying the organic gluten-free processed foods that carry that real heavy uh, price tag. Um, I feed our family of six a gluten-free vegan diet full of color, vitamins, three meals a day for about $100 a week. And we were probably spending that on Starbucks soda, beer, wine alone before the change. Um, the only real challenge is that it does require a lot of prep, whether meal planning or prepping ahead of time. I make our plant-based milks. I make our fruit spreads. Uh, every meal's from scratch. And I also work on top of it all but it is worth making the time for. It's a choice knowing that I'm giving our kids the best start that I can. It feels really good to see them go back for seconds of an all vegetable dish. And um, it's important to keep in mind that fast food options don't really save any time or money when you, they, when you look at what they cost you in terms of health and quality in life. I, I mean, listen, if you can go to a fast food place and you can get 10 chicken nuggets for a dollar, I don't think that's chicken, number one. <laughs> number yeah. two, it's definitely not healthy. There's no nutrients in it. There, you know what I mean? And, and I, we get sucked into this idea that it's more convenient, that it's cheaper. Um, and quite frankly, we get sucked into the idea that we need food all the time, right? Food is everywhere. You drive down the street and you constantly just are advertised food, 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 food. And so when you make that shift to cooking at home, when you make that shift to prepping your own meals and prepping all that one, you know everything that's going into it. So there is no question. You don't need to ask if it's organic or not, or what did you use or anything like that. But ultimately it is cheaper, right? And I think that you get family time that we lose a lot of times now. I mean, I love that you talk about having your family involved and your daughter's tearing up the lettuce and they get to choose this or that, you know, an apple versus a banana. And so it's just sometimes, I, and listen, I love technology. I love um, what technology does for our world in a lot of ways. But I think in a lot of things, we need to take a step back to how we used to do it as well. I think that it can be abused. And, you know, I love the idea of stepping back and doing the meal preps and cooking with the family and having that family time and likely the TV is off and the electronics are away. And so these, these are times that you'll never get back again with your kids. And so I, I love all those. Updates. Yeah. Well, let's just go back to one tiny little point. So you have a family of six, correct? Yes. Six? I just want to say one more time that she said three meals a day for about a hundred dollars a week. So anyone who says you can't eat clean because it's too expensive, 
<laughs> she just proved you wrong. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Um, and so I, I just wanted to point that out because a lot of people that, you know, that's one of the misconceptions, um, that you can't eat as healthy, um, on a, you know, a healthy diet on, you know, a budget, but you can, um, mm -hmm. everyone thinks that organic whole food, um, you know, meal plans and prepping and groceries are so expensive, but you're, you're living proof right there. A hundred dollars a week for six people eating healthy foods. Well, you're not going to be eating Doritos, right? You're not going to be eating all of this other junk that you think I'm going to miss it, but you won't in a couple of weeks, your palate changes, yep, right? right? And you will start craving the, the fruits, the vegetables, the healthier foods. And so, yes, you will go through withdrawal for a couple of weeks, but if you make that change, it's, it's that much easier, the longer that you do it. Absolutely. So what would be your three biggest tips for other people out there who are facing, you know, health scares with their family, needing to make a change, uh, needing to take control of their health and their life? What would you say to them? You don't have to make a sudden shift. You don't need to throw out everything processed in one go. Just maybe the next time you go to pick up burger meat, don't and grill a portobello cap instead and see how you like it instead of milk, maybe try a plant-based alternative, and then go from there. Um, I would also say uh, turmeric and ginger, add them to everything and drink a ton of water. I drink over a gallon of water a day. I even have one sitting right next to me right now. <laughs> and then uh, the very last one would be to Marie Kondo your brain. Don't mindlessly snack, pause and reflect before you eat. Um, consider what that food is bringing into your life. If you don't need what it has to offer, if you don't want that contributing to your overall well-being, then just thank it and let it go. So really quickly, Marie Kondo is a professional organizer. She has books. Um, she's well known throughout the world. Remind me really quickly, because it's been a while since I've seen some things on her. Like she asks, like when she'll go through people's houses and organize their house, she'll ask certain questions. Do you know off the top of your head what some of those are? Like some of the questions she asks people when it comes to like their personal belongings? Yeah. So like, it's just kind of like, um, you know, the first, the big one, does it spark joy? Does it That's really right. spark yep. joy? And, and there, there might be a food that's maybe not so healthy that does spark joy for you, that our food has such strong ties to um, holidays, celebrations, meals, that um, our families that we grew up with. And I think that it's still totally reasonable to still include elements of that. Um, you know, it just doesn't have to be your every day. Yeah. It doesn't have to make up every meal you have. You can find a way to substitute different pieces of that meal with maybe a healthier option. And um, if it's, if it's made, cooked in a heavy cream, maybe try a little bit of something else, maybe a plant-based alternative um, and see if it, if it still gives you that happy spark joy feeling. Um, and then uh, as far as anything else, I, blanking. So <laughs> no, you're totally fine. I, you know, I love that you said that because if you think about it long-term for your brain, first and foremost, does it spark joy? Because I think a lot of us live in our minds in a way that doesn't serve a purpose. I think we, you know, going back to what you talked about with suffering, I think we create needless suffering in our lives. Um, we create needless guilt and shame in our lives. And when you say, does it spark joy? And, and I remember now seeing some of the things where she would go through people's houses and like, hold it, feel it. How does it feel for you? And when you think about that with your mind, it's like, does it spark joy? If it doesn't, then why are you holding it there? And why is it there? What do you need to flush it out? And I think the same goes with food. If you really tie food to happiness Yes, you know, that Diet Coke might make you happy in the moment, but how is it going to make you feel long term? And if you take it even one step further, it's like looking at your food options. I think snacking is so prevalent now. And I'm not saying you should snack or you shouldn't snack. I'm not telling people how to eat. I'm just saying, you know, you go into the, the pantry and you're like, I'm going to eat this and this and this and this. And we're just constantly bombarded with food, but we're not thoughtful about it often. We just go through the motions instead of thinking, does this serve a purpose for me? 
Does this feel good? Is this going to make me feel good? It's not even just about joy with food. It's like, how am I going to feel after I eat this? Yeah, it's fun to eat things that are joyful every once in a while, that treat that you love to eat or that thing that you love to eat that may not be what you would consider the healthiest thing, but every once in a while, you know, other foods, it's like looking at it. Do I need to eat this right now? I'm going to feel good because I ate this. And so I love that concept of Marie Kondo, your brain, first of all, because I think, does it spark joy? And if it doesn't, then why are you doing it? Why do you feel it? Why are you thinking that? Why are you living in that space? And I think the same goes for food. Why are you eating it? Why is it part of your diet? Why are you, you know, why are you going through this process? I think if people thought about that a lot more with their food, they would make better choices, thoughtful about your food. It's just being intentional. Yeah. Right. And I, and and I, I think that we, we coast through life in a lot of ways and we do that with our food. Oh, all of a sudden I feel something in my stomach. Let me go run and grab some food for it. When you really just might be thirsty and you need some water or you're walking past the pantry and you're kind of bored and uh, got 20 minutes to kill. Let me grab a bag of this. Let me grab, but we're really not hungry. Or we're and, sad and we're, and we're like, we're I'm going to go eat food instead of why do I feel these feelings and what can I do to bring me joy right now too? Well, and, and I don't even know that we always even identify the feeling. We just, maybe you are sad and you just go grab some food. And, and if you just stop for a second and ask yourself, am I really hungry? You yes. might think, you know, holy crap, I don't need to eat this whole box of ice cream. Yeah. You know, um, or whatever it is, your pleasure. So I think it's about being intentional. And, yeah. and, and I think a lot of it is about slowing down. We are in such a fast paced world and technology has helped with a lot of that. It just stop and take a breath and think about what you're doing before you're doing it and ask the question why. I, that to me, I, I think is some of the best advice in the world is ask yourself why before you do a lot of things. Because once you're clear on it, then you know you're at least making a conscious decision to eat the treat or not eat the yeah. treat or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Susie, so all of this has been so amazing. I've loved hearing your journey. I've loved hearing what you've been through. I think so many people are going to be able to relate to your story. And so many people are going to be able to say like, I get that. I get that. Or I love that they made that change. I can do that too. Like this is a real life story of a massive health scare, which, you know, unfortunately is the reason a lot of people change, but like, you know, look at how it's benefited your life. And if there's other people who are facing this, they're going to hear your story and say like, I need to make that change before it gets to that point. And so I appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing your story. It's a powerful story. And it's not always easy to say like, we were at this point. It was so bad. This is how we were living. I ate like, I ate like this and I had this many diet Cokes in a day. Like some people don't want to share that, but I love that you opened up and shared your story and it's a real life story. It's so relatable for so many people. Um, my last question today is a question that I often ask of people on the podcast. You know, you've been through such an amazing journey from where your family was with your health and eating the standard American diet to changing your diet, changing your mindset, opening a bakery that serves such a major purpose in your life for multiple reasons. Um, what would be the one thing that you would say to people? If you could only say one more thing to the world about their health and their health journey, what would be the last thing you would say to people? I'd want them to know that there's no finish line on the path to wellness. Um, the continued journey is the goal. So you can't fail at this. Obviously, someone could say, if you aren't their perceived picture of healthy, then you failed, but you have to be able to give yourself some grace. No one starts their journey to wellness in the same place. Um, we all have different experiences that have led us to where we are and have led us to different decisions. We've been exposed to different food um, and to different people. And so if you take a look at me and you look at somebody like Simone Biles, I'm never going to come close to that image of health ever in my life. But for where I started just a few short years ago and for where I am now, the amount of change that I've adapted to, I'm doing quite well. Substantially better than where I was when I started. So every day that you commit yourselves to being on a journey, you're changing, you're becoming. And if things are in that continual state of change, motion and becoming, then there's never really an end every day presents a new opportunity to get better, to learn something new, to show compassion to ourselves, others and animals and our planet. And kind of like with that Marie Kondo in our brain, every um, second really is a new chance to make a new choice. Love it. And I love how you said becoming. We're constantly becoming. Um, I've had this conversation with friends before about becoming. We're always becoming a better version of ourselves, always becoming new things. And that's a beautiful thing about life. And I think that's the beautiful thing about your health journey. 
it's one story that can be something that so many people relate to, but then they can go and take what they need from your story, from other stories, from other places where they can get information on health and choose for them what looks best and change their lives. So I love your story. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Thank you for being with us. It's been incredible to hear it. Yeah, Susie, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So tell us, what, tell us the name again of your bakery so people when they're in Lansing, Michigan can stop by and see you. It's Carly Cakes. Carly Cakes. And do you have a website? Do you have an Instagram? Uh, I have Carly Cakes uh, GFB on Instagram. Awesome. Excellent. Love it. We're going to have links to everything on our website, Empowering You Organically. We'll have links to um, the different books that you recommended on there and just kind of more of your whole story. We have a transcript. We have the show notes. Um, and any other links that are pertinent to the, the show. Um, any last words, anything else you want to share? No, I've just loved this experience today. Lots of good information for sure. Susie, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're going to inspire others and you have been an inspiration. So um, thank you for all that you do and thank you for sharing your story with all of us. Thank you so much. <laughs>